Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bifear. So, the system is filled with some spectacular wonders. Things that speak to our incredible history as a species, but also places where we have suffered great defeats and endured remarkable battles. It also speaks to the number of places within the system that can be seen as tactical assets in one way or another. But as the witness comes to the system, everything we know is under threat. We need to pick and choose our battles in the defense of the system, and the defense of everything we know goes much further than simply the defense of the Lost City and the Traveler. Today I wanted to do something a little different. A video where I talk about five locations that we absolutely should defend from the forces of the Witness. This is not quite a top five video, this isn't to say that one of these locations is more important than the others, it is to say that all of them are important for different tactical reasons, and that every single one of them should be something we at least contest the witness for possession of. These five locations and objects would represent massive wounds to our forces should they be captured by the enemy. So let's go ahead and talk about these five different places that I've highlighted. In addition to this, one quick note is that I'm going to be excluding the Leviathan from our list today as it's unclear what the story of all that is going forward, and it seems as though we might be in a place where we're going to move to where the Leviathan is actually a part of our story, and a part of our arsenal anyway. Even if we don't, it's a little bit too obvious for the video today, and I wanted to cast our horizons a little wider. So, without much further ado, let's jump to it. Where do we begin? Well, I think it's worth beginning with the Vex, and in particular, we need to talk about why the Vex are a tactical asset in themselves. The Vex are the ultimate causal force. That is to say that, as far as the universe is concerned, they can outplan and outthink any foe that doesn't use the powers of darkness or light. They could beat the Cabal, Elixni, or even just simple humans because they can calculate their every move. They are capable of calculating every possible outcome for every possible future of the universe, and that means that they have the ability to bend the fate of the universe to their advantage, and arrive at a timeline where they are the ultimate victors. The only reason they are challenged in doing this is thanks to the ability of paracausal beings, such as Guardians, Ascendant Hive, the Traveler, and the Witness. The reason for this is quite simply because we break the rules of the universe. We make our own fates, as it would have been stated in the Vault of Glass, and we do this because we can choose to bend or break the rules of the universe with our abilities. The Vex are all mathematical, and for all of that mathematical genius, they cannot calculate us because we operate outside the laws of physics and mathematics. We are effect without cause. They can maybe investigate and try to understand moments such as raids on Vex installations, but that doesn't mean they'll be able to calculate what we Guardians are able to do at any given moment. There is only one figure within the Vex that has been able to come close to that, and that was Panoptes, and they have been destroyed. The knowledge that the Vex do hold still represents the most unprecedented tactical advantage in the universe, the knowledge of the Vex gives them the ability to defeat any martial foe on any world that hasn't been blessed with the light or darkness, and that power is still immense. Much more worrying, though, is the indication that the Witness is after that same power. We know this because of the brave sacrifice of the warlock Ashamir. He surmised that the Pyramid Fleet on Io was actually after the Pyramidian, a massive Vex structure, and he committed himself to defending it, given that it was one such access point to the knowledge and the calculations of the Vex. He committed himself to defending this Vex installation to the point where he entered its internal structure rather than remaining a guardian and staying as he was, and became one with the Vex instead. He chose to immerse himself in the Vex mind fluid at the center of the Pyramidian and become one with the constructs creating a sort of alliance of convenience, as best we can tell. This clearly led to Asha becoming a Vex, and we actually saw him at the end of the season of the Splicer. But more importantly, it showed us yet again the vulnerability and importance of the various Vex installations across the system. We've raided a lot of them. The Vault of Glass was breached by both us and Oryx the Taken King, and is certainly one of the more vulnerable installations, 
But the Witness has already made incursions on several worlds, such as Io, and therefore it's questionable whether the calculations of the Vex are already lost to us. That isn't all that the Vex have in store, and this is where I really want to bring up the first location of importance, and that is the Glassway on Europa. Here's the thing. Glassway has a portal, yes. It is indeed a hub for the Vex, and they did spill out onto the surface of Europa at one point and invade it. But it's not the fact that the portal there exists that worries me. It's the idea of what's on the other side of it. The Vex portal in the Glassway leads to what Clovis Bray called 2082 Volantis, but he would later realize that it would be better named as a Forge Star. Essentially, the Vex had been able to maintain a star for billions of years past its natural lifespan, and were using it to harvest the base atoms required for creating raw materials. This is a scope and scale of production that is truly fathomless. I want you to imagine if all of Earth was with just one giant factory. I want you to imagine that it's not just the surface of the Earth, but everything down from the crust and even into the mantle. Yes, I'm saying we would have needed to hollow out the mantle and then use that space and create even more structures that were just dedicated to making things in order for it to be something close to how productive a forge star might be. This is the power of raw creation in the fingertips of the Vex. The Forge Star is an incredible military asset, and in this sense it's not surprising that it nearly overran the forces of Europa when 2082 Volantis responded with Vex defenders at the incursion point. They were almost capable of defeating the Exos on Europa, and whilst the portal is still under our control now, even with the interference of Eremis, I think it is worth remembering that something with that much power on the other side needs to be kept in our grasp and out of the hands of the Witness. Immediately, if the Witness does go to the Vex of Volantis 2082, there is a problem, because realistically, the Vex cannot fight back. You see, the Witness has been able to manipulate Vex forces in the past. Take a look simply at the Vex within the Black Garden of the Sol Divisive, and you would see that they have been bent directly to the will of the Witness. But perhaps more importantly, the Witness doesn't need to do this. We saw from the Taken War and the complete sundering of the Vault of Glass by Oryx that it is entirely possible for the Vex to simply be overcome by one powerful as the Witness. And therefore, if Volantis 2082 did fall into the Witness's hands, it would spell disaster, simply by the sheer amount of war materials and raw resources that the Witness's forces would be able to bring to bear. It is not purely a fight of material means. We Guardians, by breaking the laws of the universe, regularly prove that. But it is hard for even us to fight an army of thousands, tens of thousands, millions, billions. This is what the Witness might be able to wield, and this is to say nothing of the other sensitive installations that would immediately fall should the Glassway portal fall to the Witness and the Forge Star be utilized for its own ends. We would immediately lose access to the remnants of Clovis Bray and the Deep Stone Crypt where the Exos were born. And this is to say nothing of the Pyramid where Guardians have been learning stasis. This would be something that would be a body blow to the Guardians of Sol, particularly as we start using the powers of darkness in the defense of the system going forward. Next up, I think we need to talk about the most obvious asset that we've probably just left around in the system because, well, we really couldn't do anything else with it. I'm of course talking about the flagship of the former Taken King, the original ruler of the Hive Broods, the vessel that is known as the Dreadnought. There is no single metric that can be used to measure the value of the Dreadnought as a location, so let's just go over some key reasons why we need to secure it. First and foremost, the Dreadnought is a massive hive ship, larger than any hive ship ever seen before to date. It's so large, in fact, that it dwarfs almost every other vessel in the system, although it's never been made clear whether it is larger than the Leviathan or not. Sources vary on that front, and there is no official note given to us by Bungie. My money is on the Leviathan, but that's beside the point. The Dreadnought isn't just armed with the typical weapons of a hive capital ship, and its size isn't the most potent thing about it. 
Hive weapons are devastating in their own right, but the Dreadnought is something special. The Dreadnought is armed with a weapon of devastating power that is tied to the throne world of Oryx. Essentially, what the weapon does is it takes a portion of Oryx's throne world and releases it upon real space with staggering force, decimating any material forces that should stand in its wake. Those lucky enough to die in this initial blast are spared an even more grisly fate, which is that when the wave passes over someone, they are pulled into the dimension of darkness and turned and corrupted by the witness and transformed into the Taken. Previously, these Taken would have been left under the command of Oryx, but with his defeat and death at our hands, it is likely that the Witness itself would be able to use such a weapon against us, if it was able to maybe reconfigure the Dreadnought as needed. We saw the devastating effect of this ordinance as it was deployed against Marasov and the Awoken at the Battle of Saturn. It was the event that saw the taking of Marasov and of many of her Techians, as well as the destruction of most of the Awoken's navy and the opening act of the Taken War. But how is it possible for the Dreadnought to have such a powerful weapon? It's simple to say, but a lot harder to explain. The answer is this. The Dreadnought is Oryx's throne world. You see, Hive Gods have throne worlds, these sort of pocket dimensions in the Ascendant Plane that are specifically carved out by them as they become more powerful. If you defeat a Hive God in real space, you don't really kill it. You send it back to its throne world where it will recover and eventually return. If you want to kill a Hive God, you have to kill it twice. Once in real space and once inside its throne world. Oryx knew that his throne world was vulnerable to assaults from forces both within and without, after a Vex army almost took it over. He knew that there were weaknesses that could be further exploited by his two sisters, Shivua Rath and Savathun, and so he worked to secure his throne world by literally turning it inside out. The Hive celebrate this day as a cyst in the universe, a pocket dimension was turned inside out and folded onto real space, and they call it Inversion Day. This is the equivalent of Hive Christmas, as best we know. Now the throne world is embedded within the deep layers of the Dreadnought, and the effects of this are twofold. First of all, the Dreadnought is almost impervious to most serious assaults. Mara Sov threw the Harbingers, some of the most powerful weapons of the Awoken, against the Dreadnought, and whilst it ripped apart the rest of Oryx's supporting Hive fleet, the Dreadnought was almost completely untouched. The second effect is that Oryx's throne world is far better protected. To get to it, you have to board the Dreadnought, fight off the defending Hive in their broods of tens if not hundreds of thousands, make your way to the court of Oryx at the Dreadnought's heart, and gain passage deeper into the heart of the ship where the throne world lies. It's essentially a fortress specifically built for a Hive God, or for some other individual that can make use of a throne world. This, however, takes us back full circle, and this is also why Oryx's Dreadnought has such a powerful weapon on board. It is based and linked to the throne world. So the Dreadnought, at its peak power, is a terrifying weapons platform and a formidable capital ship, but it's also an impenetrable fortress that could be protected by hundreds of thousands of Hive warriors. But I think we also need to look at this through the lens of our enemies, and in particular Shivo Arath, who would likely be interested in retaking this place. I think it's worth remembering the fact that the Dreadnought was the seat of power for the whole of the Hive Swarm for generations. It's worth thinking about the political significance of such a place and also of the religious zeal that it might lend to the troops of whoever conquers it. Shivor Rath's forces in particular would gain quite a boon from this, I imagine. The Hive have suffered a lot of defeats lately, and I don't know if it's really an impact on morale at all. I don't know if the Hive truly look at anything through the lens of morale, but the troops of Shivor Rath getting more encouragement in any form is not something that we need, and more importantly, Shivor Rath adding a powerful capital ship that would lead her armada is certainly not something we should be looking to accommodate either. We should definitely look to secure the Dreadnought as soon as possible, and it's worth noting that we have to secure it and not destroy it. 
because if we do destroy the Dreadnought's core, as a pair of Cabal Bond brothers tried to do in the Taken King expansion, most of our system would be wiped out with it. So it's crucial that we secure this ship as soon as possible, and if we can, get it moving so that we can hide it or remove it from the enemy's operational area. So next, I think we should talk about something a little unusual, something related to the Nine. You see, the Nine are a force that's not truly tied to light or darkness as far as allegiance is concerned, but they are allied with us against the Witness. To understand why, I think it's important to remember what the Nine are. Essentially, they are a sentient species of dark matter that was created by our own existence. Confused? So was I at first. It's a very hard concept to understand. Let me try to explain. Essentially, imagine this. You know what a yin and yang is? Imagine if the light or yang is us, it's real matter, our sun, our moon, the earth, the phone or computer you're watching this video on, the headphones that are in your ear, all of that is matter. The nine are a bit like our yin. They aren't exact copies of us or anything like that, but their forms are the way they are because of our existence. They are imprints, they are shadows. They essentially exist in spaces outside of us where dark matter is present, and our lives and thoughts fundamentally shape and affect the existence of the Nine. A researcher from the city called Lavinia actually went to find the Nine and seemingly succeeded in her task. The Nine comprehended her and explained the nature of their existence to her. And I think this excerpt best explains what they are. This is from the Dust Law book released back in the season of The Drifter, and it's fascinating. If you take a look at the way that the text is specifically typed, you will see that each of these different lines is a different kind of syntax. It's a different kind of presentation. It's got different punctuation. All of these different sentences always group together in paragraphs of nine. Nine sentences per paragraph. Nine different entities. Each of these sentences comes from a different voice. The excerpt in question explaining the nature of the Nine reads as follows. We try to guard and nurture you, and we cherish you as shadows cherish flame, watching your swift, bright lives flicker, die, sustained by the patterns of your thought, but distant unreachable. Beyond, what are we? Or what we were? Beyond, what we are? Or what we were? The answer lies in severing. Two sides, a single coin. Alliance and contact, solitude and silence. Do you understand our fates are intertwined? For you seed the anisotropy we sustain. But decay is decay is decay. A colossal fragility, a complex fiduciary. Tongueless, we try to speak. There must be another way. We must become more than we are. Always together, never touching. Dependence is death fated. So in their strange roundabout way, the Nine really do explain it here. They are dark matter, the dust between the matter of the universe that touches everything and is shaped by all of matter. They are the reflections of all the universe and their thoughts cannot exist without us and our thoughts. They are essentially tethered to us and would not exist without us. But how exactly did Lavinia come to have this conversation with the Nine and to comprehend them? Well, that brings us to the location that I think we need to defend. It's known by a few different things, but predominantly it is known by either A113 or the Cocytus Apertures or simply Cocytus. This is a portal gateway that allows access to the realms of the Nine, and you should know that Cocytus is also the name of one of the rivers in Greek mythology that flows into the underworld, into Hell, or what they would call the equivalent of Hell. 
We know that this is something connected to the Nine because the Nine have tried to create matter and send it through the portal to us. They eventually succeeded in sending the Emissary and Zer as beings that could communicate with us and provide us with assistance, and this is something that they have continued to do. Keep in mind that without us, they cease to exist. However, there are a pair of problems. First of all, the Nine do not appear to be able to defend themselves beyond the ability to send their emissaries and occasionally intervene with tactical, asymmetric, and esoteric means. They have no armies, and they have no ability to affect the cosmos in a direct manner. If the Witness and its forces were to discover the Cockatus Apertures, they would potentially have direct access to the Nine and would potentially be able to influence them. This would be the moment at which we would have our dependence on the Nine exposed. This would be the moment at which we would be able to see the valuable assets that they provide to us. Whether this is gifting us valuable insights into the future, as the Emissary has done, whether it is by providing resources, such as the training activity of Gambit, which they essentially allowed the Drifter to start by providing him with the Hall, or even by something as simple as sending Zer each week. The Nine have always been there in the background helping us in their own small ways. Not only would we be losing this, but I imagine that if the Witness was able to directly exploit all of the different functions and features found within the Cockatus Apertures, it might be able to gain access to all the capabilities of the Nine, and who knows what that might be. With an inverse map of all the universe and all the thoughts of the universe, maybe it would be able to achieve some form of omniscience. That is something we should not stop considering. But there's a far more grim and dark reason for protecting the Cockatus Apertures, which is simply this. The Nine know that they are dependent on us, and they don't want to be. The Nine are divided on how they should fix this problem, 5 to 4. That division was caused by the appearance of the Traveler and its ability to create effects without cause, to break the reality of the universe. With such a power as this, the Nine could potentially be free and could finally create their own structures without the need for gravity, which defined them and this would mean that they could truly be as they wish. The group of five of the different entities of the Nine is working to send figures such as Zer and the Emissary to communicate with us, which they did partly because they wished for their own continued existence, but also because they wished to study us and learn about the abilities of paracausality, so that they one day might escape their own existences tied to us. One amongst this group of five, according to Lavinia's comprehension from the Nine, is even responsible for having aided the Red Legion in conquering the last city, and they did this specifically because they might learn how to take the light. This is something that they were punished for, but it shows you the desperation of this group of five. And this still isn't as terrifying as the group of four, which is trying to push further in any means necessary to escape their fate of being tied to us and wants in no way to help us. They are trying to escape their fate by creating singularities, by trying to push great degrees of dark matter together. And all of this means that they have no allegiance to us and in no way want to tie themselves to us. They are trying to escape their fate. And here's the thing, I think that they understand that there is a strong chance that the Witness might snuff them out for good by proxy. But imagine for a second if all of the Nine are faced with a being such as the Witness. It's been able to ally itself reasonably with the Scions, and they seem to partake in its crusades without any protest. Imagine for a second if the Witness was just as persuasive to the Nine. Imagine what it could do with their powers on its side. At best, we would lose access to the Emissary and Zer and the exotic wares that we gain from him. At worse, the damage they could cause is incalculable. One of them essentially caused the collapse of the city if Lavinia is to be believed. Granted, it was simply leaving a door open, but even so, it's something we can't ignore. Imagine what the power of all of the Nine combined against us could do. Something like that is something that really does highlight why we need to defend the Cockatus Apertures from incursion, or we will lose a powerful ally and potentially 
gain a powerful enemy. Fourth on our list, this is a short one, but it's something that's a lot more important than most of the others in a more obvious sense, something a little closer to home, something very easy to understand. It's the EDZ. Now, I'm not coming along to tell you that the Trostland Cathedral and the ramshackled bars and different shop fronts are remarkable Golden Age structures that need to be salvaged at all costs, and I'm also not referring to the various Black Armory facilities that are buried in the wilderness nearby. I'm talking about a thing that dominates the skyline of the EDZ. Yeah, the Shard of the Traveler. It shouldn't be too hard to understand why that's important to defend, and, you know, this is something that we've seen directly save us once before. In the D2 Vanilla campaign, the Shard of the Traveler was able to imbue us with the light, and if the Witness is ever able to do something about the Traveler, then we'll need to maintain our connection to the light somehow. This Shard of the Traveler might just be our ticket once again, but it's more important than just that. The Traveler tends not to speak, but when it does reach out, it reaches out through visions and lucid dreams that give directions through metaphor and images. We know this because we've received these visions, and we know the potential power of these visions because they led us in the opening cutscenes of Destiny 2 Vanilla all the way to the Shard. This is something that was the Traveler directly reaching out to us and essentially telling us that we were worthy still of the light and that we had to save the Traveler overall. Therefore, we need to ensure that we work to defend the Shard of the Traveler even if we aren't particularly fans of the Traveler. Here's the thing, I know that lots of people have an anti-Traveler sort of perception of everything now, and that's not something that I necessarily agree with. After all, it's hard to reconcile the idea of why the Traveler would have blessed Savathun and the Lucent Hive with the light. But if we need to look at it from a cold, calculating perspective, we at least need to understand that we must defend this place purely because without it, we have no access to our light, and without our light, we are helpless. If the Traveler goes, we might still have a chance as long as we can secure its shard and the EDZ. Finally on our list, I think we need to talk about the Distributory. So, that's going over the heads of a lot of you, I'm sure. It's a nebulous enough name for something that's actually pretty important to the Awoken. To put it really simply, the Distributory is the original birthplace of the Awoken. To put it in a much more complex way, we need to explain some Destiny Awoken political history as well as a little of the mechanics of how the Distributory works. We'll start with how the Distributory works. So, the simple way of explaining it is this. The Distributory is contained within a singularity. Yep, this place is stuck inside of a black hole. But inside of said black hole is an entire world that has existed for billions of years longer than ours, and yet it is also younger. You see, the reason that this works is the quirk of it being inside a black hole. The singularity that has formed at the beginning of the collapse and contains the remains of the Exodus Green, which turned its human cargo into the original Awoken, has stayed in there for the whole duration, and from there the Awoken were birthed. They woke up. And the reason that they have been able to be in there for so long, and the reason they have advanced as much as they have, is because of gravity's impact on space and time. To put it really simply, time passes more quickly within the distributory. You and I could be standing outside of the black hole and watch as someone goes in. They could emerge a minute later and be a pile of bones and dust for all we know, because they would have gone in, aged a hundred years, experienced all of those 100 years, lived a happy life, settled down, forgotten about their objectives, finally realized that they needed to go and ask that their bones got sent back to us. You see, one minute in our real space is a lot longer in Awoken space, and you perceive this time at the same duration, so it's not as though you're losing time and aging at 100 years a minute, you experience all of those 100 years. Time passing like this within the distributory means that it isn't just a case of people aging faster, but also there is a real advantage to be gained from that. Imagine for a second if you decided to send in a force that would set up within the distributory, harvest resources, and manufacture, say, drake tanks. You could send those people in there, and in the space of maybe an hour, 
they could have worked for as long as 20 years. We don't know the exact amount of time difference of one minute to however long it is in the distributory, but we know that it's a lot. And the reason we know that is because some of the Awoken, including figures such as Mara Sov, have existed for millions of years in the Singularity. In fact, they existed for millions of years before they emerged back out from it, and they were only greeted by the barest of the infancy of the city. It was hardly a hamlet or a camp of refugees. They had not existed for a long time, and yet the Awoken civilization had gone on for millions of years, completely undisturbed within the distributory. So what, aside from anything else, makes this so important? I think, again, to fully explain this, you need to look at some examples. The Grey Knights from Warhammer 40,000 are an excellent example of this. Why do I say this? Well, it's because their origins and their creations initially follow a very similar story. During an event known as the Horus Heresy, where mankind is under threat, the Emperor's right hand, a character called Malkador the Sigilite, ordered eight space marines that would form the foundation of an incorruptible fighting force to go to Titan, the moon of Saturn. There, they would find all the resources they would need to create this new fighting force that was strictly loyal to the Emperor. This grouping would come to be known as the Space Marine Chapter of the Grey Knights. As a final remarkable act, Malkador would anchor Titan in the warp and would make it disappear from real space, hiding it from the enemy that had been corrupted by chaos. Now here's the thing, the warp in 40k, the time difference is just like the distributory, and in the 40k version of this, Titan was anchored in the warp and defended on all sides by macro Geller fields, and inside, what started as eight leaders and a stock of potential initiates emerged years later as a thousand marines, fully armoured and prepared for battle. Not just any marines, the strongest marines that had ever been created. This is the creation of the Grey Knights, and if you apply this principle to the distributory, you can suddenly understand why it would be such a valuable tactical asset. Now, here's the thing. Imagine something else for just a second. Mara has left some of the Awoken in there. When she left the distributory and brought the Awoken back into real space and founded the Kingdom of the Reef, she didn't bring all of her people there. So I want you to imagine for a second that there is an entire realm of the Awoken that is completely untouched, has been learning new technologies for the space of millions if not billions of years, and is waiting just inside the singularity if we can find it, ready for us to return. But you see, that's where the problem really lies. You see, it's been centuries since the Awoken of the Reef established themselves, and we only recently learned the story of how they established themselves. Granted, it's not entirely possible that the whole story is true, because Mara Sov is not always a reliable narrator, but here's the thing. The distributary when she left it was a divided place politically, and she set it up that way. She was the original reason the Awoken were created. She is essentially the being that birthed all of them. And she did not tell anyone that. In fact, she allowed someone else, the captain of Exodus Green, Alice Lee, as she would come to be known, to be believed to be the original creator of the Awoken. And this is really where problems began. You see, Alice Lee set down nine different tenants of the Awoken, and the seventh of them was that the Awoken were created as a part of a covenant between light and dark, and that they had completed that covenant, and that they were to reside within the distributary and not return to where they had come from before. This is the reason why it's called the distributary. It's named like this because it's just like a river that leaves its parent river and does not reconnect or return to it. This is the problem, because this, ultimately, created a division. Marasov deliberately created that division in the Awoken, and two groups arose from it. There were the Sanguine, who believed in that seventh tenant, and believed that the Awoken should stay put, and then there were the Echolists, who were a group that Mara was secretly nurturing all along, that believed that the Awoken were given their gifts in the distributory in order to one day go back into the cosmos and somehow save it so that they could serve and settle their debts to the cosmos. This is realistically where the conflict went about, and it has been something that has divided the Awoken for a long time. 
Keep in mind as well that when Mara and the original Reefborn Awoken left, they were attacked by the Awoken as they left. So, it's not clear where these Awoken inside the distributary lie at current. They might not necessarily be individuals that want to have anything to do with us, and so that's a real problem. But, with the technological wonders on the other side, maybe it's worth the risk that we should reach out and contact them. And if we don't, at very least, we should defend the entrance to the distributory from the witness. Because to put it quite simply, the possibility of the Sanguine being angry at us is nothing compared to the possibility of any of the witness's forces being armed with technologies that could advance them. Can you imagine what the Scorn would be able to do with technologies more advanced than their own? Hard to believe, but the Scorn are capable of the occasional intelligent thought, and if you could give a Scorn a terrifyingly powerful weapon, well, that's just a problem all in itself. So regardless of what the political situation may be, it is going to be worth us finding and securing the distributory. This is a political situation as much as is a technological and a martial one, and in order to navigate it smoothly, we definitely need help from the Awoken. I imagine that at some point soon, Mara Sov will be the one to tell us more about this. But that's all from me for now, and those are five places we absolutely need to secure and defend from the Witness. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like. Furthermore, if you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on email notifications. And, of course, you can leave your thoughts down below in the comments section. Do you like videos like this? Do you like more of the kind of top 5 stuff? I'm not necessarily opposed to doing it if it's something that you guys enjoy. So, let me know. I'll make some changes to content if needs be, and maybe this is something that all of you guys can get behind in the future. But as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been My Name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.